A few years back, there was uh, an intelligent re intelligence report that was given to our leaders that talked about uh, WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, in the country of Iraq. And what followed was a um, long battle, long war. Uh, we're still embroiled in, uh, somewhat in Iraq, but all because of this, uh, it was a faulty intelligence report, but it created all kind of havoc and um, a lot of damage. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of political battles fought over that, a lot of debates and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I got to thinking about that, and uh, one thing that is not a faulty intelligence report is there's plenty of WMDs, uh, weapons of mass destruction, still all around the world. It's in, it's in our country, it's in our neighborhoods, it's in our media, it's in our neighborhoods, it's in our workplace, it's in our home, and they're words of mass destruction. Just as probably more people damaged by our words that create destruction. We call them different things. We call them gossip, slander, uh, lies, rumors, backbiting, but they are truly weapons of mass destruction. That's why um, the scripture says in Proverbs that the tongue has the power of life and death. How I many of when you're around someone, um, you, you, you don't realize that right, maybe while you're there and you leave and you feel so good when you leave and they're, because their words are, ha, are infused with life and encouragement. But you probably also know what it's like to be around someone when you leave, you feel like you got all this gunk all over you and you realize it's because of all the things they were talking about and all that they were saying. Their tongue had the power of death. So it leads us to a big question I want to ask you today, and I want to ask myself every day. I want us to ask ourselves all this next week, do I take my words as seriously as God does? Now, I've got to tell you, this, is, this message is uncomfortable because it's just so ingrained in our daily life. It's uncomfortable for me. I dread you know, giving it because I'll have to live it before and after, and I fail at it so many times, and I don't want to, so it's a good reminder for me to watch my mouth, to watch what I say, to guard my tongue. Our words and our tongue can become weapons of mass destruction on a personal level. There's an ancient proverb that says this, telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an ax, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. Wow. I don't know if you've ever been hit with an ax. Thankfully, I haven't. My brother chased me a few times with one, but I, I managed to, no, I'm just kidding. Um, or been shot by an arrow or hurt by a sword, but that's what he relates our words to when, when um, they're used as weapons of mass destruction, when they're used as power of death. I wonder if getting hit with an axe or pierced with a sword or an arrow is how Richard Jewell felt in uh, the 1996 Olympics just up the road here in Atlanta. You remember the bomb that was discovered in Centennial Park? under a bench there on a late night celebration around the uh, area there. Richard Jewell was a, uh, you know, off-duty security guard, but he noticed a suspicious backpack under a b bench. So he went and alerted authorities, and together he helped them. They cleared the area as much as they could. Nine minutes later, a phone call was made to 911 alerting them of the bomb. Thirteen minutes later, the bomb went off. It still killed one person and wounded over a hundred, but it could have been mass destruction had he not found that knapsack. But within three days, it was leaked from the FBI to the news media that he himself was a person of interest and a prime suspect. They, they thought he was a failed law, uh, security guard, law enforcement person that planted the bomb himself so he could find it and then be a hero. And it was just something leaked from the FBI to the news media, and you know how our news media is. They just took off with that, and all of a sudden, all over the country, people were suspecting him. He was put under 24-hour hour surveillance. Uh, his name was drugged through the mud. Late-night comedians made fun of him as the, you know, uh, as a failed bomber, failed law enforcement agent and all this stuff. Um, I wonder if that's how he felt knowing, and it took about three months before the investigating U.S. attorney sent him a letter exonerating him, knowing that 
He didn't do it. In fact, it was Eric Rudolph who later we found out had bombed a gay nightclub and had bombed a couple of abortion clinics, and he was actually the bomber. But the damage was done. His life, uh, Richard Jewell's life, was just decimated. Um, the media got a hold of stuff, and it got bigger than life. Uh, uh, he sued later several of these entities. He sued NBC because they made the statement. Uh, the speculation is that the FBI is close to making the case. They, they really weren't. They, they probably have enough to arrest him right now, NBC said, uh, probably enough to prosecute him, but you always want to have enough to convict him as well, and there's some holes in the case. Richard Jewell sued the New York, uh, New York Post because they called him a village Rambo, a fat, failed former sheriff's deputy. And then he sued the Atlanta Constitution uh, journal Constitution, because they wrote, an he's an individual with a bizarre employment history, an aberrant personality. He fits the, lone pro the profile of a lone bomber, which is what the FBI said in the beginning. And on it went. In fact, they, investigate, they interviewed uh, Jewell's former employee at Piedmont College, and he talked about how that he was an overzealous uh, security guard. He would write you know, long, long reports, uh, police reports over the minor, most minor things. And so they just blew his character up and out of proportion, and he was indeed innocent. And he died about a year after they uh, exonerated him. He's like 44 years old. I wonder if he felt the arrows, the sword, and the axe pummeling him. Gossip is often more harmful and lasting than physical wounds. And if you've been a victim of false accusations or gossip, you know better than anyone about how damaging the tongue can be. So we have to ask ourselves, am I an agent of life or am I an agent of death? Do I promote life or death with my mouth? It seems to me that our culture feeds on gossip. I, I find myself drawn to it. I don't like to think of it that way. I like to think of it as being informed. Right? We can spin stuff too, right? We have talk TV ad nauseum, talk radio, and then the media unashamedly uh, committed, is committed to telling us far more about people's lives than we really need to know. Shows like Talk Soup, Extra, Inside Edition, Tabloid Stuff, blah, blah, blah. You get the picture. It's like the two ladies having lunch together and the conversation turned to a mutual acquaintance and one of the women says, you know, it's my personal policy to never say anything about someone unless it's good. And she paused, she said, and girl, this is good. Sad but true, right? I find myself in being informed via the grapevine, I so easily move to the next level of forming opinions and judgments that may or may not be accurate and oftentimes more so not accurate. I start forming verdicts even though I'm not on the jury in all these cases. So via gossip, I slip into judging and criticizing others. <clears throat> After hearing rumors and accusations, if I pass it on to other people, I perpetuate not only gossip, but possibly damning lies that could permanently harm other people in a real way. So do I take my words as seriously as God takes them? My first reaction is um, absolutely, because I don't tell lies, at least that I know of, right? But too often that's what rumors consist of, what gossip ends up being, if I pass on information that I've not checked out to be true, how do I know if I'm not perpetuating a lie? You see it every day on Facebook reports of this, that, or the other. And um, there's a little thing called Snopes.com that kind of exposes all these rumors that go around. But boy, you know what? Facts really mess up good stories sometimes. Let's be honest. Sometimes the info is just too good to wait until we get all the facts, right? The media is our lead example in that. That's why the proverb says, rumors are dainty morsels that sink deep into one's heart. Do we take our words as seriously as God takes them? Are we agents of life or death? Our words matter, and, and our words are costly. 
You know, I remember hearing about an old guy that had really hard of hearing. His family was always frustrated with him why he wouldn't get hearing aids. So one day he decided to go to the doctor, get his hearing checked. Sure enough, he needed hearing aids. They gave him hearing aids. They worked fine. He came back for a follow-up checkup about a month later. And the doctor said, I bet your family is really glad that you got these hearing aids. He said, I haven't told them, and I've changed my will three times. The book, book of Proverbs says a lot about how we manage our words and our mouth and our tongues. It points to our ability or our inability to control our tongues and how that determines our level of success in relationships with other people. It alienates us from other people if we don't guard our mouth. If we can't seem to say the right thing or if we're consistently saying the wrong thing, we're likely to find ourselves alienated from folks that know we can't be trusted with our words. Nothing does that more than gossip. Once a person knows that we can't be trusted with our mouth, we, we lose a deep connection. Again, the proverb says, a perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. I, I've got at least two people, maybe there's more now, I don't know, but <clears throat> that I've had a close relationship with in the past who wonder why I've kind of been distant from them. I've never, I'm never unfriendly uh, when I'm in their company, but neither do I seek out their company because every time I'm around them, I've discovered that I don't know anyone that knows more dirt and scuttlebutt about more people than these two individuals. You know, there are people like that in your life. I mean, that you think when you want to know something, you know they're the person to go to because they know all the stuff. They know the backstory. They can give you the down low on everything that's going on, usually not good. You know, there's, if people are always telling us the latest gossip, we have, need to ask ourselves, why is it they feel so free to tell us that? There are people that, like, they're garbage carriers, they haul garbage around, but there has to be a place to dump that garbage. And maybe in our lives, we need to just put a sign up, no more dumping allowed. They, they'll dump it somewhere, but just not at your place, not on your heart, on your doorstep. One study was done about gossip stated that uh, gossip isn't really gossip until it is seconded. When the piece of gossip is put out there, we have a choice in that moment to second it, like, oh, I know, or you're not serious, or tell me more. We have a choice to do that or to redirect it by talking about something more positive about the person being talked about. Gossip, slander, and false reports have undermined families, strained neighborhood relationships, brought chaos to our justice system. The lack of spiritual discipline in our talking has also derailed and stymied the mission of many, many churches because there's not safe places where people aren't gossiping or talking about someone. Do we take our words collectively as a church, as a community of faith, as a neighborhood? Do we take our words as seriously as God takes them? Are we agents of life or death? Social researchers estimate that two-thirds of all conversations, two-thirds, is devoted to gossip. They say technology has made it easier and faster to spread gossip and integrate it into our daily dialogues than anything. Can you say text, email, Facebook, Twitter? There was a book called Gossip, Ten Ways to Eliminate It from Your Life and Transform Your Soul. They contend that we have become addicted to this social impediment by reading and discussing the lives of other people instead of focusing on our own lives, our own mess. A husband quietly sat listening, reading his papers. His wife spoke passionately to a friend on the phone and after a lengthy conversation, he overheard her say, I can't tell you anymore because I've already told you more than I've heard. 
Now, it, that story just happened to be the woman, but it can go each, either way. You know, what's worse than a gossiping old woman is a gossiping old man. They actually come in both genders. A friend shares a verse with me that reminds me of something that's painfully true, and it's again in the Proverbs, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he holds his tongue, he who holds his tongue is wise. When words are many, sin is not absent. God is telling us through this that I should use my words sparingly and use them with care. A wise person is one who thinks before he speaks, and then he speaks with care. There was a British gentleman some years ago who was also an author, and he was going through a particularly stressful time in his life, so he, he formed a mutual encouragement group with some of his colleagues. They would get together to encourage each other. But membership in the group meant a commitment to applying a simple formula before speaking about anyone or anything controversial, and he used the acrostic think. And so they use this as a grid to run all their conversations through. First, is it true? Facts can be tricky little things that mess up a juicy story. So is what I'm about to say true? Secondly, is it helpful? Does it really help me to know? Does it really help you to know what every bad boy and bad girl in Hollywood does on a daily basis? Thirdly, is it inspiring? Does it make me want to do and be better than I am? And then is it necessary? Is what I'm going to say necessary? Does it contribute to the conversation in a healthy, good way? The scripture says a man of knowledge uses words with restraint. So it's not how much we say, but what we say that matters. And finally, is it kind? What I'm talking about, what I'm going to share, is it kind? If what I'm about to say doesn't fit this criteria then I just need to keep my mouth closed. Am I an agent of life or am I an agent of death? Scriptures in the New Testament tells us that Christ's followers are to do this. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. I don't have to say everything I know I don't have to say everything I think, and I don't have to repeat everything I hear. Because when I say everything I know and think and repeat everything I hear, the chances are pretty good I'm going to leave some destruction in my wake. Do I take my words as seriously as God takes them? If you've been on the receiving end of gossip, the victim of someone else's weapons of mass destruction. You don't have to be convinced by anyone of the importance of being held accountable for what we say. One of history's best known characters and beloved leaders was King David. In talking about a dynasty, man, this guy had a dynasty, but his life was never easy. In one of the Psalms that he wrote, which he wrote so many of the passages in the book of Psalms. He uh, was in a time of his life, it was a, during a time of his life, he was hiding from King Saul who was trying to kill him. And so he's hiding out in a cave, fearing for his life, and he wrote these words. It's in Psalm 57, he said, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. I look to you for protection. I'm surrounded by fierce lions who greedily devour human prey, whose teeth pierce like spears and arrows, and whose tongues cut like swords. There's those weapons again. Can you identify with those words? Have you ever found yourself surrounded, as it were, by a bunch of fierce lions who were like ripping you to shreds emotionally or mentally, if not physically? That their words caused you anguish and pain? I wonder if that's how, something how the 11-year-old boy felt in Atlanta a few years ago. We came home from school one day, and um, he'd made a, another great grade on his test that day at school, but he ran on up to his room. His mom didn't think anything about it until dinner, when she called him to dinner. And when he didn't come, her and her daughter went up to check on him and found him hanging 
in his closet, dead. It was later learned that he was surrounded every day at school by fierce lions who devoured him a little every day with their words, their harassing, and their slanderous accusations. Their words cut him like swords until they killed him. And millions in our country, many, many in our county, are dying a little bit every day because of our personal words of mass destruction and the pain that they cause. Teenagers, you could be such a powerful force of life in a world where kids can be very mean. Adults can be powerful agents of life speaking words of life in the marketplace, on our jobs, in our neighborhood. I don't know when we've ever lived in a more hate-filled environment in our world. I don't know when it's been easier to slice and dice people in a moment because we have immediate access to social media. I found people will say things on social media they would never say to someone's face. Never have we had more of a need for people like you and me to be agents of life instead of agents of death. We need to be about the good news that there is hope in God through Jesus Christ. That there's more to this life than the bickering and the sniping and the wars that we're engaged in. Oh, there's plenty of important battles in our world, in our nation. But in our tongue is the power of life and death. And are we going to take our words as seriously as God takes them? That's why God said in Proverbs that the, in the tongue is the power of life and death. He wasn't waxing poetically when he said it. He meant business. Now, if you're like me, it's easier said than done. Because I can find myself in a conversation so easily that is inappropriate. And hearing things said about individuals that is not appropriate. I find myself engaging in that when I'm hurt or wounded myself. You know, the old saying is, hurt people hurt people. But that's not an excuse for us not to check ourselves. And the Bible says that the tongue is an uncontrollable member of our body. Have you ever wondered why we have to keep hearing these kind of messages? Have you ever wondered why preachers keep preaching it? Because it's so hard to control. The Bible says, who can control the tongue? We've learned how to tame lions and tigers and elephants and all kind of wild beasts. But we can't tame our tongue. You know why? Because it's a heart issue, not a tongue issue. And we need to address our heart. And if you'll join me today, I'll give you a prayer that would behoove us all to memorize it and to pray it. Maybe take this handout that's in your program with you this, this week and put it in a prominent place. If nothing else, for the last verse on the bottom of your handout. Because it's a prayer again, that King David prayed, and it goes like this. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. You know, would we say it if Jesus was in the circle? Would we say it if he was riding in the car? Would we say it if he was in the break room at work? Would we say it if he was in the group text? Would we say it? I'd like for you to pray this prayer with me out loud right now and just read it together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Let's stand and uh, have a word of prayer. 
And as we pray, not only pray for ourselves, but let's pray for our country. Just this morning, uh, there was another police, a couple of police officers killed in Baton Rouge. And there's just senselessness all around our country. And we as Christians, we all have opinions about what needs to be done. But, you know, the one thing that we should be doing is praying and speaking words of life. Would you join me this morning and let's pray for that. And then when we're done, the ushers are going to come forward to receive our offering. And we're going to sing a couple of work, songs in response to God's word today. And then we'll go home. But here's my prayer is that we'll go home as agents of life. Go out to the restaurant today as agents of life. Go visit your family as an agent of life. Interact with your kids as an agent of life. Father, we thank you for your word that is so powerful, it does surgery on our hearts. That's where it really needs to cut. Lord, we pray that you would help us to guard our heart and guard our mouth so that our words and our thoughts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. And this morning, Lord, we join together as a congregation and we pray for our country. We pray for our law enforcement people for your protection and your grace and your help lord we pray for leaders all at every level of our country that they would be discerning and they would seek righteousness and they would seek the truth and they would follow it lord i pray that those of us who name you as our lord and savior that we would not be part of the problem that we would be part of the solution and yeah, vote our conscience and do things as citizens need to do, but let us not forget that first and foremost, we're citizens of your kingdom, not citizens of this world. We have duties as citizens of this world, but our allegiance is to your kingdom, Lord. And I pray that you would help us to be agents of life today, wherever we go, when we leave this building, when we go about our way, when we go to work this week, when we start back to school in a couple of weeks. There's going to be students and kids that have a rough go of it at home or at school, and we can, our words can make a difference. May it be so that we do that, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.